Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 17. 1 Samuel, chapter number 17. The title of the message is rather lengthy this morning. If I can't be the big, let me be the small. If I can't be the big, let me be the small. When you get to 1 Samuel 17, you'll probably recognize the chapter right away. That's the story of David and Goliath. I'm not going to preach on the entire story. I'm just going to pull one verse out of the midst of it. Verse number 40. Look at 1 Samuel 17, verse number 40. It reads something like this. And he, that's David, and David took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. When you read the story of David and Goliath, who do you associate with? (laughs) That's kind of a silly question. Hopefully you don't associate, identify with Goliath. Uh, Goliath's not the hero of the story, he's the anti-hero. He's the antagonist. To put it in simple language, he's the bad guy. But not only is he the bad guy, he's also against God, which makes him the loser. Before that man even got out of his bed that day, he was already the loser. We don't want to identify with Goliath. We want to identify with David. David's the man of God. And as I began to think about this Bible passage, Bible passage, Three statements came into my mind. It's those three statements that I want to share with you this morning. The first one is the title of the message. If I can't be the big, let me be the small. Believe it or not, in this particular story, David is the big. Now, you know the story of David and Goliath. You say, preacher, that can't be. Uh, Goliath is the giant. And indeed, by all the statistics, Goliath is the big. Best I can tell, trying to convert those ancient Israeli measurements into our measurements, this man, Goliath, would have stood somewhere around 12 feet tall. You've never seen anybody 12 feet tall. I've never seen anybody 12 feet. I don't ever want to see anybody 12 feet tall. The the coat that he wore was made out of uh, mail. That, that, That means it's a metal type of a coat. Not exactly what they wore in King James days when they had the knights. Uh, it would have been more of a, of a flexible coat, more with iron rings probably welded together. But that, that one coat that he wore weighed, best I can tell by converting the measurements, 216 pounds. He wore that as a jacket while he fought fights with his enemy. Just the spear head, the head of the spear that he threw weighed 26 pounds. Now, if he's going to throw that thing, that means he has to have a shaft on it and it has to balance the spear head. So it has to be at least 26 pounds in weight too. But unless he wants to choke all the way up and be holding that spear, that javelin at the spear head, it's going to have to be even longer than that. So it's possible that that javelin weighed somewhere around 55 to 60 pounds. Listen, that's what he threw to kill people far off. He threw something that weighs 55 pounds to kill people on down the holla someplace. This man, by all the statistics, he was the big But when it came to standing before God, he didn't even rank on the scale. David is the big. Title of the message. If I can't be the big, let me be the small. We need some bigs. We need some bigs like David was big. At this point, David, with nothing but his bare hands and his faith in God, has already slain a lion and a bear. That's big. At this present time, what we're reading about in this chapter, he's already tried on Saul's armor. It didn't fit. That's no surprise. Bible tells us that Saul was a tall man, head and shoulders above the average Jew in the land of Israel. Bible says of David, he was ruddy. He was small. Maybe he grew more after the Bible said that, but at the point where the Bible described him as ruddy, he would have been smaller than average. No way he could have wore Saul's armor. He set that aside. Now he's down by the brook. 
He's got his shepherd's staff in his hand. He's got a sling. He's got a little shepherd's bag, and he's looking for five smooth stones to put in it. He's going to go face this 12-foot giant that wears a coat of 216 pounds, has a spear with a head of 26 pounds. He's going to go face him with nothing but a sling, a staff, and his faith in God. Let me tell you, that's big. Not only is he going to face him, he's going to defeat him. He's going to lay that giant on the ground. He's going to pull that giant's sword out, cut off that giant's head, and that will cause the nation of Israel to win the victory that day. They've been hiding in the rocks for 40 days because of what David did with his faith. Israel will defeat the Philistines on that day. That is big. Oh, but that's just the beginning of David's life. I mean, in the next few days, the next few weeks, he'll become a soldier. Then he'll become captain over soldiers. At some point, he's going to marry the king's daughter. Eventually, he will become the king. He'll write the Psalms, many of the Psalms that are in our Bible today. He'll be called a man after God's own heart. He'll reorganize the temple. He'll create the priesthood, redesign the priesthood so that it can function much better. He'll introduce praise and music inside the temple of God's house like it had never existed before. And before he dies, he'll gather most of the material so that the proper temple, no longer just a tabernacle, but the proper temple of God could be built. I'm telling you, that's all big. We need some big Christians like that today. We need some Christians like some of yesteryear. Man, I was privileged to sit under some of the greatest preachers of the last generation. Got to hear John R. Rice preach, Bill Rice preach, Hyman Appleman preach, Jack Howes preach, Lee Robertson preach. Uh, the list just goes on and on. Jack Hudson preach. I mean, uh, uh, the list just goes on and on of some who were the bigs in that day. Uh, not just popular, but I mean they, they, they founded churches and they built them up to be what we would call today mega churches. They won hundreds. They won thousands. They won tens of thousands of people to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was that generation that revamped our missions program, gave us what we call today faith promise, so that missions today is more vibrant than it has ever been. We need, we need some bigs in God's kingdom today. You should want to be a big. You should want to use your influence and your power to help other people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. You should want to minister to the people who are broken, the people that are poor, the people that are needy, the people that are lost, the people that are in addiction. You should want to bring them to the light of Jesus Christ and set them free. You should want to comfort the brokenhearted. You should want to minister to those who are weeping with their tears. What we need today is we need some big Oh, I want to be the big. I, I've always, not, 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 not big in numbers, but I've always wanted to have more of God's power, more of God's presence, be used to touch more people for the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but, if I can't be the big, oh God, let me be the small. Not everybody can be the big. David's the big at this particular time. He's going to get more bigger. He will become the king, and he will become the type of king that Israel had never seen before. He will come, become such a powerful king that he will lead the entire nation of Israel to turn to the Lord God Almighty, and they will literally follow God for the next 60, 70, 80 years, all because of the influence of this one man. This man was big in the kingdom of God. But not everybody can be big. If, if David is already there, if he's holding that position, he can't necessarily be the big. I want to be the big, but if I can't be the big, oh Lord, let me be the small. You see, God uses the small too. In the book of Zechariah, don't turn, but in the book of Zechariah, God speaks to this man, Zechariah, and asks them a question in verse number 10, chapter 4, verse number 10. For who hath despised the day of small things. For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with these seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. That last part doesn't make any sense to you, but get that question that he asked. Who hath despised the day of small things? That was God speaking to him. 
through Zechariah. Why was, why was God asking that question through Zechariah to the children of Israel at that time? It's because they had sinned against God, gone into the Babylonian captivity. They had been away for some 70 years, but now God had brought some back into the land. During the, the, the war, Nebuchadnezzar slew many, scattered many more. I don't know really how many thousands, tens of thousands were killed, slaughtered, slain, scattered. But just a small remnant had been carried by God to preserve them over the land of Babylon. They'd been there for 70 years. Then God gave them freedom to come back. And of the small remnant that went to Babylon, only a small part of that small remnant came back. You can actually read their names in books like Ezra and Nehemiah. They're listed in those books by families and by names. Just a handful of people. Not even enough to fill up the city of Jerusalem. They actually had to, to, to devise a plan to protect the walls of Jerusalem because there wasn't enough Jews in the land to defend the walls of one single city, let alone fill up the entire nation. It was a small nation. God brought them back in the land. And now God's asking them, do you despise small things? He said, I'm using you. You're a small thing. But not only were they a small thing, the temple was a small thing. They were there at that time trying to rebuild the temple of God. The temple of God had been of gold, of silver, of precious stones. It had been a mammoth undertaking. But once the Babylonians destroyed it and the Jews came back, it was to be much smaller. And it wasn't going to have the gold, and it wasn't going to have the silver, and it wasn't going to have the precious jewels. It was going to be very plain. As a matter of fact, when they finally got the entire temple built and they dedicated it, it had been, it'd been destroyed for 70 years. When they finally got it back up and they dedicated it, some of the old timers that had seen the first temple began to weep and to mourn. And they wept and they mourned so loudly, as the chapter 3 says, that you could not discern whether the sound that was being made was the weeping of those that had seen the old temple or the rejoicing and of those that had part in building the new. So many people were weeping at how small and plain the temple of God was. But yet, God was working in the midst of that temple and God was working in the midst of that nation. God asked him, you're going to despise the small things. By the way, it might have started out small, but it didn't stay small. That very nation, that very seed that God planted in those days, in Zechariah's days, are the same Jews that were alive and in the land when Jesus walked on this planet. As a matter of fact, Jesus was a descendant of those very people that were in that land. And the temple, the temple that Jesus walked through is the same temple that they began in that day. It had been embellished, it had been added to, but the, the basis of that temple that Jesus walked in and out of was the very temple that was being uh, laid in the days of Zechariah. And God would ask, do you despise small things? Don't you know? God not only uses the big, God uses the small. Elijah understood that. In 1 Kings chapter number 17, the famine, the drought that he had prayed for was well underway. Land was beginning to go bare and people were getting hungry. He didn't have any food to eat. God said, I want you to go to this widow's house. And he, he, he walks up to the widow's house and she's out in the yard. He says, hey, I'd like you to make me a couple of, 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 of loaves of bread, a couple of uh, pans of bread. She says, I can't do it. She says, I'm out here right now gathering sticks. He says, all I got left is just a couple of hands full of flour in my house. And, and, and just a little part of a cruise of oil. He says, I'm fixing to bake that with the sticks I gather. Then me and my son, we're just going to lay down and die. Elijah said, well, that's your plans. But he says, before you lay down and die, how about baking me a cake of bread? And you know what God did with that little bit of flour and that little bit of oil? He fed all three of them for the rest of that drought. Apparently not just for the rest of the drought, but until they had a chance to put some crops in the ground and get some food so that they could eat, God provided with the small. Why? Because God doesn't just use the big. God uses the small. 1 Kings chapter 18, God sends Elijah to go tell Ahab, I'm, I'm going to end the drought. And so they're up on the top of Mount Carmel. Elijah goes off to the edge someplace and he starts to pray. And it, it, it looks like he's having some problems getting a hold of the throne of God. He had to go out there on that ledge and pray seven times. But on the seventh time, he looks out over the hillside and he sees a cloud starting to form about the size, the Bible says, of a man's hand. 
About the, about the six, eight inches, about the size of a man's head. Elijah said, that's all, all that's needed. He went back and told Ahab, he says, you better get down off this mountain. A flood's about to come. And sure enough, from that small little cloud, God took, uh, put a, a flood down on the nation of Israel. But it's not just the Old Testament. God uses the small in the New Testament too. Remember in Matthew chapter 14, Jesus has been preaching to 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. He said, we need to get these folks something to eat. They begin to scour the countryside. What can we get them? Well, there's nothing here. This one boy, he's brought five loaves of bread and, and a couple of fishes. Now, when the Bible says five loaves, don't be thinking about some bean that you go to the grocery store. Now, it's not, we're not one of those long loaves. Mama didn't send him with five sunbeam loaves of bread. No, no, it's five little biscuits. I mean, he was just a little kid. Uh, made him five little biscuits, maybe, maybe like a chicken McNugget. Made him little five bite-sized biscuits. He had five biscuits, and he had a couple of fish, and this was his lunch. Oh, Doubting Thomas says, I'm not sure we can do much with this. Jesus said, I could feed the world with nothing at all. This is more than enough. And when they got finished feeding the 5,000, not counting the men and the women, they had 12 baskets full. They ended up with more than they began with. How do you do that? Because God blesses the small. God doesn't just use the big, God uses the small. We need some big. We need some big. We need some people to get on fire for Jesus. Some people that want to see souls get saved. Some folks that will start praying and pray until God answers. We need some big. But if I can't be the big, God, let me be the small. In this story, the story of David and Goliath, is there a small? Well, yeah, actually there is. Verse number 40. David's there at the brook, and he's looking around in the brook, and he's looking for five small, smooth stones. He's not looking for five boulders. He's not going to try to hurl a bolter at this man. He can't hurl a bolter. He may be big in the eyes of the Lord, but that man's a giant. He can't hurl five boulders. He's looking for five smooth stones. And he's standing at the brook, and I can see him in my, in my eye, as his eyes looking over to see what, what rock might fit good into his sling, what, what, what small little pebble might fit good into his hand. And he sees five, and I'm thinking to myself, wonder when God put those five small stones in the bottom of that brook. Wonder how God put those five small stones in the bottom of that brook. In my mind, I'm thinking maybe those stones started out somewhere up on a hillside someplace. This brook means water's flowing through. Israel doesn't have water flowing through it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 12 months out of the year. Uh, they have what they call former rains and latter rains. And whenever it rains in Israel, the rain usually falls up on the mountains, and then it becomes a flash flood, and it flows down into the valleys. So I'm thinking, maybe this rock wasn't actually there in the bottom of that brook to start with. Maybe it was formed somewhere up on the top of the mountain someplace. Matter of fact, maybe it was a part of a much bigger rock. Maybe God through wind or, or through some storm or through, through, through water and ice or, or, or maybe even through a lightning strike. Maybe God cracked some huge rock, shattered it into many pieces and, and the, the smaller pieces just fell off the base of the rock. Then one day God sent that flash flood. Maybe not just one, but maybe flood after flood. I don't know how big these rocks started out. I don't know how long it took them to go from where they were to where they are. But each time God sent a flash flood, those little pebbles get picked up, tumbled in over in, knocking the hard edges off, rounding them, smoothing them, until finally they got to the place where God said, I want you to sit right there. I want you to stay right there. i got a plan for you. I don't know if that's how it worked or not. Truth of the matter is I think that's how it works for most of us. Most of us, God has to knock us upside the head with a lightning strike or two. And then he's got to roll us down the, the hillside. He's, he's got to send us through some turbulent times, kind of roll us end over end, smooth off the hard edges, kind of, kind of make us usable, soft, rounded, so that we could fit into the master's hands. I, I don't know if that's how it worked for you, but I'm still getting rolled down the riverbed. I, I know that's how it works for me. Maybe, maybe that's how those stones came to be at the bottom. But then again, then again, he is God. He is God. Maybe back in the beginning, when God was creating the heavens and the earth, he said, I know one of these days, David is going to be standing in that spot right there, and he's going to be looking for five smooth stones. Maybe God just created those five stones, said, I want you guys to sit there. And maybe since the day God created the heavens and the earth, those stones have just been sitting there 
waiting for the day when God would send David to come find five smooth stones. Maybe you're not like me. Maybe you're not the guy that needs to be tumbled down the riverbed over and over, end over end. Maybe you're the kind of a person God just created you and you've got the good temperament, you've got the sweetness about you. Maybe God just planted you where you're at. And maybe sometimes you get kind of confused because you don't understand why God's not using you. You just hang on. There's a David coming because God uses small things. I don't know how the rocks got down there, but I know when it came time. For David's eyes to look for something that he could use. And for David to stick his hand in that riverbed, that, that, that creek bed, and start running them up and down those rocks to find something that would fit good into his hand and something that he could fit smoothly into his sling. I know his hand came across five smooth stones. He said, these, these are the stones that I'm looking for. These are the stones that catches the master's eye. These are the stones that fits the master's hands. I want to be the big. But if I can't be the big, God, let me be the small. Let me be the one that catches your eye. Let me be the one that fits into your hand. Let me be the one who's where you put me at. Let me be the one that you can use. If you can't use me but once, God, if I can't be the big, well, God, let me be small. I don't know too much about how God creates rocks. But I know God did something with these five. Maybe you never have. I don't know if you're an outdoorsy person or not. Not very many folks are anymore. But I remember when I was a kid, I'd, I'd, I'd be out playing in rocks. I'd be honest, we couldn't afford toys. So we, we'd play in rocks. Uh, uh, I used to make mud pies and make the dog eat them. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's how I learned my culinary skills. <laughs> But I bend over before to try to pick up a rock, and it wouldn't give. I mean, it looks like it's just there on the top. You reach over, and you, man, that thing's down there. I'm glad those five smooth stones weren't like that. David reached over, and those stones yielded to him. Those stones were willing to be used. Not only that, he picked up five. And I know he's got four brothers, but he picked up five, which means there were four stones that didn't get used that day. I don't think it mattered to David which one of the stones he picked up. They were all good stones. He just picked up one. One fit into his hand. One fell there first. That's okay. God, God may have many of small people. God might have many smalls. That's all right. God might not use you today. You just stay in his pouch until he puts his hand down there and he reaches for you. And, and if you're the small that God reaches for, be like the little stone that David picked up that day. It didn't deviate. It didn't digress. It didn't deflect. It went right where he aimed it. And that little bitty old stone is what brought that big old giant to his knees. I want to be the big. But if I can't be the big, well, God, let me be the small. God uses the small. First statement that I wrote down when I was reading this Bible passage, if I can't be the big, let me be the small. Second thing I wrote down was, if I can't be the first, let me be the second. If I can't be the first, let me be the second. David wasn't used to being first. If you remember back to the book of Samuel, Saul had been the king and God had determined that Saul had to be laid aside. He was rebellious. God knew that all along, but it was time to set him aside. And so God told Samuel, said, Samuel, I want you to go to the house of Jesse, and I want you to anoint me there, a man to be king over Israel. And so Samuel comes, and he enters into Jesse's house, and he says, show me your sons. And Jesse starts parading his sons in front of him, oldest to the youngest. And the first one, Samuel looked at him, that's him. That's him. God spoke to his heart. You're looking on the wrong side. You're looking on the outside. I'm looking on the inside. No doubt he was the biggest, oldest, most scrapping. Uh, he was no uh, Samuel saw him. He thought, man, he's a lot like Saul. And God looked at him and said the same thing. He's a lot like Saul. I can't use him. The Bible said he had seven sons in the house, prayed at all seven of them around. And then it's almost like Samuel asking something of desperation. He says, are these all your sons? And Jesus said, no, there's one more. The run of the litter. 
He's out there in the fields. He's keeping the sheep. He said, send for him. We're not going to eat till he gets here. And as soon as he walks to the door, God says, that's the man. Anoint him to be the king over Israel. But wait a minute. He wasn't the first that day. He was the last. David's used to being the last. But now he's not the last. He's the first. Israel had been hunkered down, carrying behind rocks for 40 days. Would you think about that for a moment? Their army had been stalled, being humiliated by Goliath for 40 days. That's more than a month. 40 days. In that entire 40-day time period, the Bible doesn't indicate that one Israeli stepped forward to go out there and meet Goliath. You would think somebody would have accidentally stumbled forward in 40 days. Uh, maybe he didn't volunteer, but maybe one of those three stooges type things where everybody else steps back and he's just left there on the front. But no, 40 days, not one man had gone out to the battlefield. David was the first. Saul didn't want him to go. He figured he'd be annihilated in a second. Tried to put him on with his suit and army, uh, armor. Son, you don't stand a chance. You don't even know how to fight. He's a seasoned soldier. But he let him go. Why? Because he's the first one dumb enough to do it. That's what Saul thought. He's the first. He'll continue to be the first. He'll be the first godly king that Israel has ever had. Saul was before him. Saul could have been a good king, but he wasn't. I don't think he knew God. I think he knew about God. I don't think he knew God. Uh, you might not know it, but there was actually another fellow who anointed himself to be king back in the book of Judges. Abimelech anointed himself to be king. He didn't last very long. He wasn't a good king either. Truth of the matter is David was the first good godly king. He was so good. David was such a good king over Israel that if I understand the prophecies of the book of Ezekiel, God is actually going to let David be the king over Israel again during the millennial and maybe on into eternity itself. You say, wait a minute, I thought Jesus Christ was going to rule over the world. He will, but Revelation tells us he's going to raise and glorify the dead, and he's going to give them thrones and let them rule with him. I believe David's going to get to rule over the nation of Israel. Go back and read the book of Ezekiel and see if you don't think that yourself. He was that kind of a king. He was the first. But there's a problem with being the first. You can't have but one first. I mean, if David is the first and he's the king, you can't have another first. But I'll tell you this, David didn't do all that David did by himself. David had a lot of seconds that helped him out. Matter of fact, they're listed as David's mighty men, listed twice. But one time in the book of 2 Samuel, I believe it's chapter number 38, 37 men are listed as David's mighty men. Now, there's no doubt in my mind there were more than just 37. He had armies that followed him. He had soldiers that willingly laid down their life for him. But 37 men are mentioned by name in 2 Samuel, I believe it's chapter number 38. These, I think, are his seconds. David was the first. He couldn't do everything, but he had some men that were his seconds. First one on that list was Adonai. I'm saying that wrong. Ad, Ad, Un, Adono. There you go. Adono. Adono was his second. You've probably never heard the name Adono. Adono went out with a spear in his hand and defeated 800 of the enemy soldiers, apparently all by himself. What a miraculous feat. What a skilled soldier. He wasn't a David. David was a first. But Adonai was a second. Second man that's in that list is a fellow by the name of Eliezer. Now, you've probably heard the name Eliezer before. It was a common Jewish name, but you've probably never heard of this man before. Bible describes this man. He went out with a sword. He fought the enemy so long that when he had defeated them all, they had to pry the sword out of his hand. He had fought for so long that his muscles had gripped that sword and could not release the sword. Fourth man was, excuse me, the third man was a man by the name of Shama. S-H-A-M-M-A-H, Shama. Shama the Bible says, went out and fought a troop by himself. I don't know how big a troop is, but I suspect we're talking about hundreds of soldiers. When it was all said and done, he was still standing. They weren't. Hey, three men, I'm supposing three godly men, three men that helped David, three men that fought for David, probably three men of great character. Yet they weren't David's. David was the first. These were the second, the third, the fourth. Not everybody can be a first, but that doesn't mean we sit down and quit. 
Maybe everybody would like to be the first. First in righteousness, first in holiness, first in godliness, first in being able to care for others, to minister to others. Maybe everybody would like to be the first. Everybody can't be the first. God, I'd like to be the first. But if I can't be the first, Lord, let me be the second. God, if I can't be the second, let me be the third. And God, if I can't be the third, let me be the fourth. And the list goes on. 37 names are mentioned. And yet I'm sure there were more than just 37 that were David's mighty men. What am I saying? I'm saying we're living in a hard time. God needs some big. And God needs some first. God needs some to quit saying I can't and start saying I can. God needs some to quit saying I could and start saying I am. God needs some people to quit complaining about what's going on and start being the men, the women, they'll stand in the gaps to change what's going on. God needs some big. But maybe you can't be the big. Maybe you're not qualified. Maybe, you, maybe you're, you're, you're right when you say you don't have the gifts, you don't have the abilities, but you're just not able to. Maybe you're right, but that doesn't mean you can just sit by and do nothing. If you can't be the big, be the small. Maybe you can't be the first. Maybe you're not the best at everything. Who is the best? There's very few Davids in this world, very few folks that have all those opportunities that start out with such a rich treasure of abilities and gifts from God. But you could be the second. You could be the third. Reading that story, I thought to myself, well, I'd like to be the big. But if I can't be the big, let me be the small. God, I'd like to be the first. But if I can't be the first, God, let me be the second. Third statement I wrote down. I'd like to be the many. But if I can't be the many, let me be the one. I'd like to be the many. I, I could illustrate this from David's life. There were times when David had many. As a matter of fact, David usually always had many. Uh, very few times when David actually had to stand alone. He went out on the battlefield with David and Goliath, and it was just him. He stood alone that day. He could stand alone, but the truth of the matter is quite often David had many others around him. As a matter of fact, as soon as Saul began to persecute David and he had to flee... The Bible tells us that others began to gather around David so that ultimately he had a good-sized army himself. And I'm sure those 37 mighty men began in those early days when David was fleeing from Saul. So he, he could stand by, and he would, and he did. But the truth of the matter is quite often David stood among men. I could illustrate that thought from David's life, but let me go to a different Bible passage. Let me go over the book of Exodus. Take your Bible if you would. Go with me. Look at Exodus chapter number 15. Different time period. Different big at this time. David was the big in the book of 1 Samuel. Moses is the big in the book of Exodus chapter number 15. Different first. David was the first. Now Moses is the first. Israel has just, just come out of the land of Egypt. Literally just come out. They, they've crossed over the Red Sea. The first half of this chapter is Miriam's song that she wrote and led Israel in as they praised God for the victory that they had going over the Red Sea. But on the other side of the Red Sea was desert, and they hadn't been out there very long, and they realized they were thirsty, and there was no water. And the first place they come to, pick up verse number 23, Exodus 15, 23. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. Marah means bitter in Hebrew. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When, which he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statue and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Would you notice, God showed him a tree. A tree. Doesn't say showed him a forest of trees. Doesn't say showed him a woods of trees. Doesn't showed him many trees. Just showed him a tree. I'd like to be the many. I would. Because I'm the preacher, people think things about me that aren't necessarily true. 
you think I'm intelligent, then you see what I do to the bulletin, and I just bust that all to pieces. Some people actually have the notion that I'm smart. I'm not. Some people have the notion that I'm courageous. I don't think that I am. I'd like to be. But the truth of the matter is, I'd rather stand with a group than stand alone. I, I, I want to stand with a group that's wanting to do what God wants. That's the group that I want to stand with, but I'd rather, I'd rather be part of the many. I get comfort. I'm more comfortable standing in a crowd than I am standing by myself. I, I believe, and I, I've done it a time or two, stood by myself, but I'll be honest, there's been times when I should have stood and I didn't, so I'm not quite sure how courageous I am. I'm just saying, I like the many. I'm comfortable there. Maybe you are too. But if I can't be the many, God, let me be the one. They come out of the land of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They're now into the desert. They've got two million plus people with them, and they need water. Now they've come to this pool of water, this pond of water. It must be a large amount of water. It must be at least the size of a lake. You can't water two million people and a livestock from just a little swimming pool size pool. It's got to be ample water, but the problem is the water's bitter. And God says, there's a tree up there, Moses. I want you to go chop down that tree and throw it in the pool of water, and when you do, it'll be made sweet. And Moses did what he was told to do, and God did what he promised he would do. It wasn't many trees up on there. It was just one tree. Things cross my mind. I wonder things. My wife and I talked about this on this trip. It, it, it's dangerous, some of the things I wonder. But I wonder, how in the world did that tree get up there? How in the world did a tree... We're in a desert. This isn't an oasis. This is a desert. How in the world that tree going to... I'm no biology student. I, I, I don't understand animals and I don't understand plants. But I'm thinking everything's got to come from a seed. How in the world did a seed get dropped in the crack of those rocks so that that tree could grow to begin with? Did God get some bird, some vulture, some eagle, some hawk, uh, some 15 miles, some 20 miles, some 30, 40 miles away, and say, hey, I want you to pick up this seed right here. I want you to pick up this apple core. I want you to pick up this, this nut, and I want you to fly till I tell you to quit flying. Did God put that seed in some bird's claws and say, just fly that way? And then when, when that bird got over that particular spot, God said, now drop it. Is that how God planted that? I don't know. I don't know, but to be the one just like with those five smooth songs, we have to find out where God wants us. We have to put ourselves in the place where God wants us to be. Somehow that tree got just where God wanted it to be. I don't only wonder how did it get there. I wonder how did it survive? The waters of this pool were bitter. They weren't fit for human consumption. Does that mean they weren't fit? For plant consumption either? I don't know. Maybe that's why it's a lonely, scraggly tree up there all by itself. Maybe there were other trees there at one time, but they, they couldn't survive in the terrain. They couldn't survive in the arid desert. They couldn't survive without clean, pure water to drink. But that one did. That one did. That one was right where God wanted it to be. That one was surviving. It was standing all by itself, all alone. I want to be the many. If I can't be the many, God, let me be the one. Let me be right where you want me to be. Let me to stay, stay there, tall and straight. I don't understand a lot of things about seeds and agriculture, but I know one thing, trees don't grow overnight. The Bible didn't say he looked up there and saw a weed. I know weeds. You cut your grass today, they'll be five foot tall tomorrow. He didn't say there was a weed up on the embankment. He said, somewhere up there, there's, there's a tree. The tree had to grow over a period of time. That means that tree is not just standing today. It's been standing for a while. It's been standing up there all by itself until the day God brought a few million Israelites down that needed a tree. Oh, man, I'd like to be the many. I'd like to be the many. But if I can't be the many, God, let me be the one. And I know trees aren't humans. They've got life, but not like we've got life. But I do understand this. In order for that tree to accomplish what God intended that tree to accomplish, Moses had to cut it down. He had to kill it, throw it to the pond. That tree gave its life to accomplish what God wanted 
to be accomplished. I'd rather be the many. But if I can't be the many, God, let me be the one. I'm saying there's some things that you and I as believers have to decide in our own lives if we're going to be used by God. Even if we're not going to be the bigs. The more I thought about it, the more I realized the same commitment is required for the small as is required for the bigs. The same training, durability, spiritual stubbornness is required for the second that's required for the first. The same type of love, determination, and duty that's described for the one, uh, for the many, is described for the one. If we're going to be what God wants us to be, there's some decisions that are going to have to be made. First decision you need to make is if you've not trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to be saved. Jesus Christ died for you on the cross. Two things you've got to do if you're going to go to heaven. Number one, you've got to believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. You can't go to heaven if you don't believe. You've got to believe he's the son of God. You've got to believe that he was virgin born. You've got to believe he lived a sinless life. Died a vicarious substitutionary death on the cross. Was buried for three days, rose on the third day. You've got to believe that he'll save you if you ask him to. If you don't believe these things, you can be a good person. You can be a religious person. You can be a pastor of most churches. But if you don't believe these things, you can't go to heaven when you die because without faith, it is impossible to please him. If you've never believed on Jesus Christ, you need to do that today. That's just the first thing. Second thing is you've got to repent. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. I know there's a lot of folks that do believe what you need to believe, but you've never surrendered yourself to Jesus Christ. I don't mean you're going to be perfect from this point on. I don't mean you're going to be sinless. I just mean there's going to be a new Lord in your life. Jesus Christ will be the one that you seek to follow and to please. There's been no change in your life. There's been no Christ in your life. Those two things can produce the marvelous miracle of the new birth. Where does it start? It starts at the foot of the cross. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, would you trust him today? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the people to preach to. I thank you for their attention. I pray, God, you do something in our midst. Lord, help us to want to be, if not the big, the small. If not the first, the second. If not the many, the one. God, help us to find the place that you've created us to be. Help us to be that one that catches your eye, that one that fits in the palm of your hand. Help us to fulfill whatever purpose you've created us for. There's somebody here that doesn't know you as their Savior. I pray that they would be saved today. If we can help in any way, I pray that you'd show us how. You lead us and guide us. We'll give you the praise, for we ask it in Jesus' name. With your head-